Now, the ventricular atrium is the most appropriate part of the ventricle to measure. And this is a structure which has many, many things to uh, offer itself as the key uh, structure in looking at the fetal central nervous system. First, it is a structure which is stable in size throughout the second and third trimester. The fetus is the most dynamic structure you will ever study in your life, and the fetal central nervous system is the most dynamic system within the fetus. Of all the things that you could observe with inside of the fetus during the second and third trimester, there is exactly one that is stable throughout that period, making it an age-independent measurement. It has an excellent position marker, the choroid plexus. So, on an axial scan where the choroid ends and the fluid in the ventricle begins, that marks the position of the glomus of the choroid plexus. The glomus marks the position of the ventricular atrium. The walls of the ventricular atrium are reasonably perpendicular to the direction of beam travel, which means that they will specularly reflect which means they'll be easier for us to see. Indeed, you can see that the medial wall is a better specular reflector than the lateral wall, and that is also highly fortunate. Visual assessment is easy. There is a natural relationship <clears throat> between the size of the glomus of the choroid plexus and the size of the ventricular atrium, such that the glomus will fill or nearly fill the ventricular atrium and if it does, no measurement is required. That is a normal ventricular atrium. It is also the earliest to dilate, which makes it our most sensitive structure. Now, I know that when you are studying neuroradiology, if you are an obstetrical sonographer or sonologist that studied neuroradiology, you may remember your teachers telling you that the temporal horn is the earliest to dilate. Well, that may be true in children and adults, but I have detected ventriculomegaly in fetuses before there was a temporal horn. And finally, there are signs which help us to diagnose true positive cases and avoid false positive cases. Now I ask you, what more could you ask for from a single structure? There was a time in my career when the right portal vein was my favorite anatomic structure. It has been replaced by the ventricular atrium. In my early career, there was a very famous, in fact, the most famous ultrasonologist of that era, he used to introduce me at Congresses by saying, our next speaker is Dr. Roy Philly, who parlayed the right portal vein into a professorship in radiology. That was not far from the truth. So you could well imagine that the ventricular atrium has to be a very special structure to have replaced the right portal vein in my heart as my most favorite anatomic structure. There will be times when you must measure the ventricular atrium. Here are the rules. We begin it must be measured in a true axial plane. I'll tell you how to do that momentarily. Second, we want to measure across the posterior glomus. So we need to see where the choroid plexus ends and the ventricular fluid begins. That marks the position of the glomus. We want to measure across the distal glomus. We want to measure perpendicular to the ventricular axis. That means we must determine the, pin, uh, the ventricular axis and measure perpendicular to it. We do not want to measure perpendicular to the midline, as is the case with certain other ventricular measures. Finally, we want to place the cursors at the junction of the ventricular wall and the ventricular lumen. So we want to measure this distance we do not want to measure that distance. To put this simply, 
we want to measure the shortest distance across the ventricular lumen at the ventricular atrium. So once you're there, uh, you have all of the rules. Remember that the wall of the ventricular atrium is a pendema. The pendema is one cell layer thick. And while I have great respect for the resolving capabilities of ultrasound, it cannot resolve a one cell layer thick wall. Therefore, anything that you think is the wall of the ventricle is not the wall of the ventricle. Do not include it in your measurements. How do we know we're making our measurement in the true transverse axial plane? Well, we run into a problem here with in utero sonography because near field reverberation artifact causes us to be unable to compare symmetry of the brain as our certainty that we are looking at a true transaxial plane. Therefore, we must look at cell, uh, symmetry of the calvaria. The more perfectly symmetric the calvaria, the more certain we are that we are looking at a true transaxial plane. Again, I will point out to you that the medial ventricular wall is a better specular reflector than the lateral ventricular wall. And again, this is also very important to us and very fortunate. If you measure a large number of ventricular atria, you will find that the mean diameter is six and a half millimeters. One standard deviation is 1.3 millimeters and three standard deviations is 10.4 millimeters. We have tested and used 10 millimeters as the upper limit of normal. Why? Because I like round numbers. And I'm proud to say that most of the world uses 10 millimeters as the upper limit of normal for the fetal ventricular atrium. There is a lower limit, but it's only of theoretical interest to us because there are no diseases or anomalies of the fetal brain which produce a ventricle that is too small. And now in large prospective consecutive series totaling over 7,000 fetuses, the ventricular atrium was visible in 99% of the cases. So uh, if you're having a problem seeing the ventricular atrium, you're having a real problem. And you're not going to solve that problem by saying, oh, I'll look at the temporal horn instead. As I said, measurement is typically not required. And this fetus with unilateral ventricular megaly is an excellent example. The upside ventricle is normal. And you can see that the glomus of the choroid plexus fills the ventricular atrium. No measurement is required. Whereas on the downside ventricle, you can't even see the glomus of the choroid plexus. Clearly, this is an enlarged ventricle that is a normal ventricle no measurements are required. The only reason you would measure this ventricle is to get an idea of the degree of enlargement, not whether it is enlarged. So here is Mrs. Smith. She comes for her sonogram today. You observe that the glomus of the choroid does not fill the lateral ventricle. You are obliged to measure the ventricle. You do. 9.2 millimeters. That is less than 10. Therefore, that is normal. Now, I have been accused in court under oath of being a 10 millimeter absolutist, and I pled guilty as charged. I can assure you in your lifetime, you will not meet another ultrasonologist who has thought more about or done more investigations of the fetal ventricular atrium than I have. And after many years of due consideration, I have become a 10 millimeter absolutist. What that means is that I believe that using 10 millimeters creates the most good while causing the least problems.
I can assure you of one thing that I have learned in my studies that have set this upper limit of normal at 10. If you set any upper limit of normal, you can be assured of only two things. Normal patients will fall above your limit and abnormal patients will fall below your limit. With that in mind, I have decided that using 10 millimeters as a cutoff is what I am going to do in my practice. Now again, notice that the medial wall of the ventricle is a better specular reflector than the lateral wall. And that turns out, as I've said, to be highly fortuitous. Why? Because we have a constant marker for the lateral wall of the downside lateral ventricle. And that is again, the glomus of the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus is not firmly held in the ventricle. Therefore, from its position where it is tethered at the foramen of Monroe, it must hang down under the force of gravity until it meets resistance at the lateral ventricular wall. Therefore, the lateral margin of the downside glomus of the choroid plexus always marks the position of the lateral ventricular wall. The upside ventricle also acting under gravity meets resistance at the medial, not the lateral ventricular wall. As the ventricle enlarges, the choroid must dangle down until it meets resistance at the ventricular wall. Uh, when I originally uh, described this sign, the dangling choroid sign, that was in a stage of my development as a prenatal diagnostician, where I considered that evidence of an enlarged ventricle. I no longer consider it evidence of an enlarged ventricle. What it does represent is a definite clue that we must measure the ventricle and compare the size to 10 millimeters. Now, I taught my early fellows <clears throat> this sign, and when they went out <clears throat> and studied the ventricle themselves, they did a study showing that uh, if this gap is greater than three or four millimeters, then that is a sign of an enlarged ventricle. All of these signs are legitimate signs, and I am not trying to denigrate them. What I am saying is that after due consideration and looking at all of the evidence, I am a 10 millimeter absolutist.